So briefly about some other forms of authentication. We've focused mainly on passwords. We use passwords a lot. They're not very good. There are many vulnerabilities with using passwords. Many things can go wrong. But they're widely used. Users are happy to use them. So uh, we need to understand how to store them and, and how to select them. But now let's just look quickly about using tokens. Just define what we mean by a token and then biometric authentication. By tokens, quite briefly, we mean some object that the user has, that they possess. And they use it for authenticating. <clears throat> so we call that a token. Different types, they may be cards, they may, may, not, may be USB drives. Uh, so some object that we have. We can even think of a mobile phone as a token now. This table just lists some examples of the, the card type tokens that people have had. Uh, the magnetic stripe ones have some stripe which have some information encoded in it. So in, the, in your possession of that card and you swipe it, and then that uh, can act as some form of authentication. Some of your cards, especially from banks, will have some electronic memory inside. Or smart cards even that have not just memory to store information, but also a, a proce processor to do some calculations. So they are examples of different tokens. Some are contact smart cards where you need to touch it with uh, some electrical contact. Some are, have some radio device embedded so that we can uh, be nearby. And you can think almost as some of the features of mobile phones like, what's it called, NFC, near field communications is a technology in mobile phones that allows you to have your phone within a few centimeters as of a reader and that can exchange information and you can use that for authentication. So in that case, your phone is acting, acting as a contactless token. You don't have to touch it, you just have to be nearby. It has some, a radio uh, device inside. So there are different types. Some of the issues that come up. Uh, so memory cards, mainly we've seen them with, with banks, for example, that they, a bank card. Uh, a credit card, an ATM, and so on. They often store data. At least the older versions would just store data. They don't have a processor inside. They can't do any calculations, so they just store data. Uh, and there was ones with just the magnetic stripe, but most today have some electronic memory inside. And usually are combined with a password or a PIN. So they, we have two forms of authentication. That is, you need to be in possession of that card as well as know the PIN to be authenticated. So that's quite good security because it, it relies on both forms. Guessing someone's PIN is not enough. You need to have the card. Stealing someone's card is not enough. You need to know the PIN. So it combines two forms. Compared to uh, just using passwords on their own, though, what are the problems? Well, it requires a specialized reader. Okay? It requires hardware to read it. Uh, if you lose the card, that's a problem. If you lose the token, you need to go back and be inconvenienced to get a new one. And you need to carry it around with you. So you may be not as happy. You can carry the password in your head. You carry the, the card in your bag or wallet. And it's not just a card, it also applies for, say, other types of tokens, those issues. Smart cards really means, in this case, uh, tokens that in include the ability to do some processing. So they include a processor on board. And some, some banks, for example, will issue customers with such cards or, or devices which may even have some keypad on it. So it's not just uh, for storage of information, but it will do some processing. Maybe it prompts you to enter uh, some value, type in some value with a key keypad, and it generates some random value, which is then used as a password. So it's a combination of password plus the, the smart card. And again, your mobile phone can do similar things. The one-time password is a similar concept. 
That is, something is sent to your phone, uh, a one-time password, a, a, a random value that you then use to log in. So the similar concepts as what we use for our mobile phones today. There's some interface sometimes. Uh, so if it's not a mobile phone base, you can actually get cards which look like a very small calculator. You can type numbers in and it has a little display and it will generate uh, secure keys for you. And there are some w different protocols for them to communicate with a server to, to check authentication. We're not going to touch upon how that authentication works. Uh, I just wanted to mention that, of course, there are tokens. I don't have any examples, though, other than your mobile phone that you... Right, right. So I do have examples. Of the simple ones you know of, all, all of your uh, bank cards and so on. Uh, and the other one you may have used is your mobile phone that's when a message is sent to you to generate something or maybe even for payments. So a number of companies, Google, Apple and so on, have payment-based systems. Where, when you have the mobile phone, you just put your phone near some payment processor and it will make the payment. Uh, so that's a form of a token-based authentication. Just be aware that we don't just have to use pins or passwords, we can use physical tokens as well. But maybe we'll say a little bit more about the last technique, biometric authentication. So try to authenticate people based upon their physical characteristics. And it uses usually some form of pattern recognition see some examples of that. Compared to other approaches, passwords and tokens, it's usually much more complex and as a result more expensive to implement. So we don't see it as widely used because of those reasons. But it can be more secure in some cases. So what physical characteristics? Your face. So the idea is that people, di people have different facial characteristics. So if we can recognize from their face, those characteristics, they may, may be able to recognize that individual person and authenticate them. Fingerprints, the shape or the geometry of your hand, your retina, your iris, so the, the two parts of your eye, uh, your voice, and your signature when you sign something. So I think some of these you have used, signature especially, fingerprints maybe, uh, some of our rooms have fingerprint scanners on them to, to get access. Which one's best? Retina, fingerprint. I think it turns out iris is considered one of the best ones. Your iris. Iris is the color part of your eye. The one that gives you color. If you've got blue eyes or green eyes, that, that part of your eye is the iris. The retina is the, the, the ball, the, the, the part covering the, the eyeball. So there's a trade-off with different biometric schemes. This roughly compares them with respect to cost and accuracy. So cost in terms of you need some, some hardware to, to recognize the pattern from that physical characteristic and accuracy in terms of how good is it at authenticating people. And in terms of accuracy, the best one is iris. That is, if you can read the iris of someone, then it's a very high probability, if you can read it correctly, that you can identify and authenticate that particular person out of everyone in the world. The problem is it's quite costly to, to have equipment to do that. So iris is the best in terms of accuracy, the highest accuracy, but also the highest cost, financial cost. Voice, for example, is the least accurate, or one of the least accurate, but it's quite cheap. You just need a microphone and then some processor to, to record the voice and then compare it to some characteristics of a stored voice. But lowest accuracy in that what may happen is if someone talks into the microphone and the system's trying to check it, then there's a much larger chance that you'll make the wrong decision and either uh, not authenticate the person when it is the right one, 
or authenticate the person when it's someone else. And we'll talk more about those two, two choices in a moment. So that's a rough comparison saying that uh, some are cheaper than others. Voice and face and fingerprint are cheaper than iris and, and, and retina and hand. And some are more accurate than others. Just a rough comparison. This illustrates the, the approaches for how to implement this in practice. And the top picture, sh called enrollment, shows what happens when we register. So first we must register our physical characteristic. This one's for fingerprint, but it similar applies for the other characteristics. To register, what we do is we maybe supply our name or some password or PIN as well. We may optionally have that. And we scan our fingerprint, for example. There's some sensor that, we, that scans the fingerprint, that uh, looks at the fingerprint. And the system does not store, say, a photo or a copy of your fingerprint. What the system does is looks at your fingerprint and tries to extract what's called features from that fingerprint that will be unique to you or unique to that fingerprint. So think of it, if the fingerprint is this picture or is a picture of the fingerprint, it doesn't store the actual fingerprint, it stores some, uh, some points in the fingerprint which are unique or something that identifies the shape or the curves of the, the lines that uh, is unique to that user. So there's some component which extracts those features from the biometric information. The system stores those, that information in a database as well as your name or your ID and, and optionally your, your PIN. Then later when you want to use the fingerprint to identify or authenticate you, well there are two different approaches and it separates between verification and identification. And they're slightly different. Verification is checking that the person is who they say they are. Identification is finding out who this person is. Identifying a particular person. Let's look at them. With verification what happens is that the user submits two things. Their name, maybe a PIN, but some identifier and their fingerprint in this example. So what I do is maybe I type in my name or my user ID and also scan my finger. So I submit two things to the system. The sensor gets a copy of my fingerprint so when I scan it on the sensor it gets a copy and then it extracts the features from that scanned fingerprint. When I submit my name or ID the database looks up or well, the system looks up in the database that name and from the registered or enrolled data it finds the matching entry and it finds the features which were stored from the enrollment. It says here uh, one template. I think it, it contains the data that was stored. And then the data which was stored is compared against the data which is extracted from the scanned fingerprint if they match, then we are verified. If they don't match, it fails. This is like our password verification. We submit our ID and the password. The system compares them to the stored values. That verifies that this user is who they say they are. Identification is slightly different. Identification is just using the password to find out who you are. You don't submit your name. You just scan your fingerprint. The sensor grabs your fingerprint. The feature extractor, the software, extracts the, the key parts from the fingerprint, some, some information from it about the, the contours and so on. And then the features from the scanned fingerprint as compared against, in the worst case, all of the fingerprint information in the database. And we try and find a match and if we find a match, we've identified that user. If we don't find a match, then we haven't identified that user. So this is just identifying users, not verifying a user against the username. 
slight difference there. Which one's easier? Think of verification versus identification in terms of implementing the system, which one's easier here? Why is verification easier? Right, it's about one template versus n templates. With verification, there's a database. Let's say we have uh, a thousand users. The database has entries for each user and their corresponding fingerprint information, the fingerprint features. With verification, we submit our name. So from the database, we find that name in there and we find the features. And here it's denoted as that one template that one set of features for that user and then we just compare that against the features for the scanned fingerprint. That's quite easy. But for identification, we scan the fingerprint and we must compare the features against all of the entries in the database to, or, or up to all of them to find one that matches. And that can be much more processing intensive because this comparison of features requires really some pattern recognition which can be uh, complex to do and to do accurately. The same approaches apply for other physical characteristics, not just fingerprint. It's about the same for others. Questions before we see the last few slides? How to authenticate? Ask me. Could you explain this again? Verification is like we use for passwords. We want to check that this person, by this name, is who they say they are. And the way that we'll know is if their fingerprint matches the enrolled or registered one. So it's like I go to the door, I type in my PIN, my unique ID, and I also scan my fingerprint. The system looks up my fingerprint information, compares the stored value against the scanned value. If they match, I'm verified. OK? Sure? And identification is just identifying that particular person out of the set of all users. They have different purposes. What have we got left? I think two of these three slides we'll look at. In all cases, the, the challenge with biometric authentication is comparing or distinguishing between a real user Okay. Any comments on authentication on your phone? Let's get through the last two slides. The challenge with all these biometric authentication techniques is distinguish, distinguishing between the real user and the attacker. We're well, listed here an authorized user and an imposter. An imposter is someone who's pretending to be someone else. What this diagram shows, you don't have to be worried too much about the details, but we can think that uh, the first curve here, this imposter profile, means that if we look at the features of an imposter, we can think there's a high likelihood that they'll have the features within this range. And a normal user, or an authorized user, in this range here, where it says profile of genuine user. The challenge with biometric authentication is that often the features of an imposter will overlap with the features of a normal user. We'd like them not to overlap. Then it would be easy. But in practice they usually do. And what it results in is that when we compare the features stored in the database with the features supplied, either in verification or identification, we may need to make a decision whether they match or not. This feature matcher needs to compare them. And it's not easy to compare, say, a, 
two images and see if they are similar. Because they don't have to provide exact matches, they need to be similar. Because there may be some differences. So, so the, there's some decision that says, okay, uh, the features supplied, are they close enough to the stored value? If yes, then we accept it. If no, then we say reject. The problem that arises is that we may get cases where we have false matches or false non-matches. A false match, so this, this grey area here, is when an imposter submits their fingerprint, for example, and the system authenticates them. Because the system compares the imposter's fingerprint to one that's on record, and it compares them and it sees that they're very similar, so it assumes that they're okay. That's a problem. That's in this diagram called a false match. And that happens when the profile of the imposter overlaps with the profile of the genuine user and we accept that imposter. The other problem is when we reject someone who is actually the right person. I go scan my fingerprint, the system compares my fingerprint against my registered fingerprint and, and unfortunately it returns they don't match. They're too dissimilar because again my registered fingerprint and the scanned one when I try to log in will be different. My, maybe my finger is oriented in a different way, it's sweaty or whatever. So it will be a different image. So the system has to do a comparison and find out whether they're very close or not. And then it makes a decision and if it makes a decision saying that they are too far apart then it's a, a false non-match in that the genuine user is treated as an imposter and they are not allowed in, for example. So there are the two issues. We need to make sure that we'd like a low number of both of them. We don't want to allow the imposter in so we don't want to make the wrong decision here and let someone in who shouldn't be. And similar, we don't want to block the normal users from getting access. So we don't want to have false non-matches. And this slide compares some of those different biometric techniques with respect to false non-match and the false match rate. So from some studies, they've come up with some data. We'll just look at a few the data points and explain what it means. Let's take a data point just to explain this slide. So where? Fingerprint. Fingerprint is a circle here, uh, the white circle. Uh, this point. This point says that the false match rate is what? 0.001% and the false non-match rate is getting close to 10%, maybe it's 8%, so it's on a logarithmic scale. How do we interpret that? That says if we want to have a, a false match rate, a false match rate is the percent of times that an imposter gets wrongly accepted into the system, gets wrongly ver verified. So if we want to keep that less than 0.001% then with a fingerprint it suggests that we're going to have to accept close to 10%, maybe 8 or 9% of false non-matches. That means about getting close to 10% of the time a normal user will be rejected. Again, this data point tells us, let's say we want to make sure that the imposter, the chance of them being authenticated is less than 0.001%. With fingerprint biometric authentication, that suggests that if we have that, then about 8 or 9% of the times our real users will be rejected, even though they have the correct uh, uh, biometric characteristics. We'd like the data points to be as close as possible to this far left bottom, or this, this bottom left corner. We'd like a very low false match rate and a very low false non-match rate. So this compares those different schemes. For another example, 
Uh, face recognition. This blue dot here. This tells us that if we're using face recognition, then we can get 1% of the time we'll get a false match. Meaning 1% of the time the imposter will be accepted when they shouldn't be. 99% of the time will be okay, they'll be rejected, but 1% of the time the imposter will be accepted. And in that case, we'll have about what's this, maybe 20% of the time that a normal user will be rejected. So we need to weigh up the, that, that trade-off of not accepting the imposter but not rejecting the normal user. Which one's best? The one that's closer to this point is the best and in this case Iris. It says that with a false non-match rate, that is re rejecting our normal users in the order of 2 or 3 percent of the time, we reject the imposter point o o or we accept the imposter point o o o one percent of the time. So very few times do we accept an imposter and only a few percent of the times will we reject a normal user. So that's just a comparison of the different techniques. We've looked at what you know, passwords, what you possess, briefly, tokens, and what you are or do, biometrics, as ways for user authentication. Make sure you know how to store a password. You store a hash of a salted password, we say. The salt and the hash. Uh, the salt and the password are hashed. There are many issues which we don't discuss. How to select good passwords, how to implement them and the many vulnerabilities of different authentication techniques that lead to multi-factor authentication. We'll stop there, we'll have a quiz tomorrow morning and then we'll move on to access control. <laughs>